This is in honor of the fallen, those who have stood in the gap for righteousness, even when they've been hated and still put their life out there. I think this woman has lived her life and has forgotten more about injustice than most of us in this generation will ever know. And I think she would know a racist person when she saw one. Hey, how's it going? Welcome to my channel. Hey, in this video, I'd like to uh, pair up the idea of Uncle Tom versus the Negro lover. Christmas, the deplorable is on deck. It's now okay to think. What's your thought on, on Black Lives Matter? What is it? What, what do you mean? The idea is that there's this movement called Black Lives Matter thinking that the rest of America didn't seem to understand that, that Black Lives Matter. It just sounds weird. I don't know that you put a name on it. It's not a name. It's not whatever, whatever. It's somebody got shot by police and for a reason. I am a young, black, rich if that don't let you know that America understand black matter these days, I don't know what it is. Don't come at me with that dumb man. My life matters. There's only one group in America, one time, that truly cares about the lives of black people in these urban ghettos. And it's the American police officer who goes down there on a daily basis, puts their life on the line to protect who? Black people. So when you say we just want to have a conversation, let's have a conversation about the black-on-black -black crime, which kills more black males, which is more of a threat to any black male in the United States than a, than a, than a law enforcement officer. Sure. All lives matter. It's a black man that killed my kid. So how can people preach black lives matter? I don't believe in that. All That's lives the point matter. we need to, to get to, is that we need to deal with our own internal issues before we move forward and, and start pointing fingers and start attacking other people. We need to solidify ourselves as people and, and deal with our issues because I think as long as we have black on black crime and, and, and black, you know, one black man killing another, you know, if you if black lives matter, the nation matter all the time. Um, um, I am a chief financial officer for a veteran service organization and that's here in Washington. I'm also a mother, I'm a wife, I'm an American veteran, and I'm one of your middle-class Americans. And quite frankly, I'm exhausted. I, I'm exhausted of defending you, defending your administration, right. defending the mantle of change that I voted for, right. and deeply disappointed with where we are right now. I, I've been... I've said to people sometimes, you know, I've been black all my life. You don't have to tell me how to be black. <laughs> and so um, I think we need to recognize that in some ways the height of prejudice is to look at somebody and think you know what they think because of the color of their skin. But when you think about it, it's harder for me as a black man to be called, be called an Uncle Tom from a black person than it is to be called a nigger from a white person. What would be so serious that anybody black or white would be willing to even look like they're a traitor to their own people. Okay, first off, let's talk about the history of the term Uncle Tom. When you say somebody's like Uncle Tom, that's a sellout. Uh, and, and originally the term um, came based off of the book Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe, she was an abolitionist. Uh, she was not writing the book to uh, showcase the proper way to be a good obedient slave. She wrote the book to showcase to the rest of the world what life feels like from the point of a slave, from the standpoint of being a slave. And then... She puts the Christian uh, uh, aspect to it, 
And what she's saying is uh, because slaves would convert to Christianity. And she was saying, basically, what if Christ was a slave? This is what he would be like. And um, it, it originally was a, an endeared term among blacks and abolitionists, meaning that if you said uh, so-and-so is a Tom or an Uncle Tom, it meant that they could be trusted. It meant that they would harbor runaway slaves and whatnot. Uh, uh, and it, would, it, was, it was, again, because uh, uh, blacks and whites were on both sides of the issue of slavery, that was code for meaning this person will help us. If you were if 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 you were an abolitionist against slavery, and if you were white, same thing. And Frederick Douglass would use it in a very endearing way to describe fellow abolitionists, people who would you know uh, risk their life. It became derogatory around 1910 because of the migration of nearly six million blacks leaving the South, going to the North and to the Midwest and the West. And uh, the Northerners uh, didn't like the fact that the Southerners were coming up blacks, didn't like the fact they were coming up competing for their jobs. The Northerners were called the Southern blacks Toms because, uh, because of the book Uncle Tom's Cabin and because it was they didn't want them compete they didn't like the competition for the jobs okay now we've talked about the history of the term we've talked let's talk about the fact that history is skewed they called us pilgrims but today we are thieves we trust in god's design our faith helped us to cross an ocean faith and a contract with strangers. The Merchant Adventure Company, without whose support we could not afford the journey. They came for fortune. We came for God. To build a new life. To worship as we pleased, free from persecution. Starved and desperate, 102 passengers arrived in the new world, guided by the Lord. But there were some things God neglected to mention. So we think of it like that the white man left Great Britain, came here and did to the Native Americans what was done to him, persecute. And um, the thing is, it wasn't just one boat full of pilgrims. There was all kind of people trying to come here to the new world. And the truth is the pilgrims were really just along for the ride. The rich and powerful were looking to becoming more rich and powerful. And they weren't gonna sit up and meet and negotiate with the Native Americans and Thanksgiving, they have time for all that. They hated the concept of God. Hey, watch this. First time at sea, Mr. Bradford. I've seen you and your lovely wife at the rail often enough, spewing into the wind. It's not my first time. I've sailed from England to Holland and back several times. With all due respect, sir, such as that's a Sunday outing on the Thames. Not that you would desecrate the Sabbath by taking pleasure in it. You catch my meaning. I'm not certain that I do. Well, how shall I put it? The worst is yet to come. We have come this far and not lost a single soul. We will endure. And a week from now? When the water is nothing but scum at the bottom of the barrels and the scurvy rips through your congregation like grease through a goose. Will you endure them? By God's grace, we will. I wager that before we make landfall, that I'll be sewing off your people in a shroud and tossing them overboard. I hope you are not so inconvenienced. Not at all. It would be my pleasure. Good evening to you both. Why do you talk to the man like that? I sailed to Jamestown with Blackwell separatists. I and mighty such as these. 180 of them packed together like earrings. No fresh water, scanty rations. God will provide, God will provide. 130 of them died on route. God has chosen them alright. To die of scurvy and the flux. 
and their own pride and self-righteousness. And he will choose these two. So you can hear in the captain's voice that he resented the pilgrims. There was no love and they, they weren't working together. You got your thing, I got mine, but he saw them as dead weight. They didn't have a whole lot of money. They weren't heavily armed, but they were gonna come to the new world. Even if they died, even if they starved or died of disease, they were gonna come to the new world talking about some faith. Christ, God, he didn't have, he didn't understand that. He could understand wealth, power, and money, but he didn't understand all that. But the, 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 the sailor represents that side of Britain, Spain, all these places that they were gonna come and plunder, but they weren't gonna say nothing. But they were all about taking as much gold and land and natural resources by force. And the missionary didn't have nothing to do with that. He was on the boat with them. But then the people with the money, which usually is the governments and these, these uh, uh, private enterprise, they're the ones who tend to write history. So when they re rewrite history, they're not gonna say, yeah, we were the people who came and, and slaughtered the Indians. No, it's actually the pilgrims. See what I'm saying? They rewrite it, they write it in such a way that the people, the last people who would be likely to do these things, get the blame for doing these things. And so you grow up with this idea that the the, you, the pilgrims are really kind of hypocritical, bad people with Bibles, uh, the Quakers, all these people, because look what they did, it, it, is, it wasn't like that. In fact, they tormented those Quakers and those pilgrims like they did the Indians and the, and the, and the natives. That leads me to my next subject, the first people to have a problem with racial injustice, slavery, were people like that. In the times of slavery, if you had a problem with it you were, and you were white, you were looked at as a traitor to your race and you were called a Negro lover or Negro lover or nigger lover. You know, it wasn't there were there wasn't liberals as you would call it. Is the 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 you know they liberals see themselves in the reflection of uh, someone like William Lloyd Garrison, and that the conservatives were the devils. But really, it's the other way around. It was the people that we don't we had we have no time for. It was people who believed in right and wrong, who believed in the Bible. It was Puritans, Quakers, uh, and people like that who withdrew from society were the first ones having a problem with slavery. People like Francis Daniel Pisterius and others protested slavery and their cardinal issue was treat other people like we would like to be treated. And um, they would argue back and forth with slave traders because the slave traders would take the Bible and you know how uh, people still will say, well, the Bible sanctions slavery. So let's actually read the Bible. Check out Leviticus 25, 53 as uh, and you're basically I'm going to summarize it as a yearly hired servant. He should be with him and the other shall not rule with rigor over him in thy sight that word rigor is a, is a way of saying savagery and that's where you get what you see on roots with the beatings every day that wasn't what the scriptures are talking about when we say the bible sanctions slavery another one when you look at something like uh this one and if thy brother a hebrew man or hebrew woman be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when you send him out, basically thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt flourish him, you will furnish him liberally out of thy flock. Everywhere you see, if thou buy a Hebrew servant, da da da, it's talking a contract. It's as simple as if you grew up in Sunday school, uh, remember that Jacob agreed to work for Laban for Rebecca. Well, 
it, the proper term under the truth of scripture is it would read like Laban bought Jacob and the payment was Rachel. And so that was that was how slave traders would would justify uh, slavery. And the, and the Bible never talked about running in, running into native lands and, uh, and abducting people for the sole purpose of making money off them or treating them like animals uh, or lower than animals. So they serve you. That's that. The, the, that's a diff, that's something else. That's a distortion. There are many people who were in the transatlantic slave trade who, because of the fear of God and people feared God. I know that's hard to grasp, but they had slaves under the chattel slavery system. They, out of their faith and a deeper understanding of their faith, they would set their slaves free and they became abolitionists like this man. person after person they you treat people the way you want to be treated and person after person they were called race traders they were called nigger lovers they were called they and, and they were hung they were drugged through the streets and they were white and they had a problem with the concept of taking people from their land and then creating an animal to serve another person and they put their life out there and I think that some of that was presented because we didn't want the, the, the powers that be wanted you to feel like there was never a time in history where people worked together for the common good. And they also wanted uh, to stamp out God. And they also wanted white supremacy all rolled into one. But it wasn't just white supremacy. It was those other things. And you can't have white supremacy and the scriptures and really have a leg to stand on. On the subject you know? of slavery, I will not excuse, I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. I am willing to be persecuted, imprisoned, and bound for advocating African rights. I feel, my Theodore, that we are the two halves of one whole, and that the Lord has given us to each other. All kind of rumors had been flying about the wedding and the guest list and the social mixing that had gone on. Southerners decide oh, we're being attacked and you need to bring these scoundrels to justice. They must be kidnapped, they must be assassinated. There was all kind of white on white violence in the shadows and in the open. Like this uh, Democratic Senator Preston Brooks beats Charles Summer basically unconscious with a cane in 1856 over slavery. So it wasn't the North against the South. It really wasn't even black against white so much. It was one political party against another. The Klan even was not put into motion to go kill black folk. When the black folks got killed was that they were Republicans and the Republican Party was biracial. So the only way that the Klan could identify who they were trying to take out, they made these. 
these are push cards and as you can see this biracial and that was how they knew that that's how they knew who to kill you were called radical because you it's it wasn't because you were like uh antifa it was because you were a person of faith the vast majority of them were people of faith and that you would stand up for right and wrong and what's right in the face of what your culture is saying in the face of your race in the face of making money you would stand up for right and wrong if it cost you your life So it's really such a big deal that really in the South, you lynched maybe 4,800 people at one period of time. Well, it may surprise you to know that 1,300 of those people were white. So it wasn't black against white. It wasn't North against South. It was one political party against another. And the political party catching all the hell was biracial. So blaming all of America for everything that went on wrong is like blaming all of Germany for the Holocaust. We were given social studies in the place of civic history. We don't even know the difference between a democracy and a republic. And if it sounds heavy for me to say, consider this. So you got the Battle of Bunker Hill. Americans were running out of ammo. British started tearing Americans up. One man shot a British lieutenant colonel and the British were utterly confused and the American lives were safe. So if you look at this picture, you got Lieutenant Grosner, you got Peter Salem. The black man, Peter Salem, shot the lieutenant colonel and he wasn't treated any different than any other soldier who saved a lot. He was given medals and congressional medals and medals of honor and he was presented before the brass just like anybody else we don't have to we don't get to know that in fact it's so serious that in the 80s a bunch of professors were looking at the picture and said no 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 uh we don't think this is peter salem at all forget peter salem this was osaba this is lieutenant grosner's slave lieutenant grosner's the white guy this is his slave uh osaba that's when that and, and and that was decided in the 80s. Those same liberal professors decided that. Was that do, to do us a favor? And since when has a slave been holding a gun? So it's so important to make the founding fathers look bad. We'll do it even if we have to hide black achievements. This is your heritage. America has a rich history full of heroes of all types, but the ones we hear the least about are African-American heroes. African-American heroes have been part of American history from the very beginning. Our tendency in textbooks today is when we tell about black history, we start in the 1960s and move forward. Right. And that's an important era of history. Dr. Martin Luther King and all the things that went with that, the, the, the March through Selma, the March on D.C., it's all important. But that's not where black history starts. Right. We have some real heroes of black history that we can take way back to the beginning. Great example is Richard Allen. Richard Allen is an African American who became the founder of the first black denomination in America. His is a great story. He was raised as a slave in Delaware, living as a slave on a plantation in Delaware. And a Methodist evangelist came riding across that plantation preaching the gospel. Richard Allen hears the gospel, he gives his life to Christ, becomes not only a Christian, he becomes a zealous Christian. Richard Allen started sharing Christ with everything that moved on that plantation and shortly the slave master became a Christian. The slave master says, what am I doing on his slaves? Mm -hmm. So Richard gets his freedom. Well, Richard wants to keep preaching the gospel. So he, he walks out of that plantation, walks out of Delaware, going north. He ends up in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia at that time was the nation's third largest city. There were 40,000 people in Philadelphia. You can imagine that being the nation's third largest city. <laughs> Richard ends up preaching in a church in Philadelphia where He's preaching to 2,000 people a week. Now, wow. that's a mega church today, that's but that's mega really a mega church. But, yeah. Oh, and by the way, it was a white church that he was pastoring back then. Wow. Wait, they, they didn't do that back then. Oh, yeah. 
There are so many examples of black and white together in early American history that there is definitely racial conflict as you go through parts of history, but there was so much cooperation that we never hear about. And so Richard Allen, great patriot that he is, actually becomes one of the soldiers in the American Revolution. So here's a, a pastor. He's a soldier in the American Revolution. He gets hooked up with signer of the Declaration, Dr. Benjamin Rush. So here's an Anglo. Here's an African-American. They're working together. It's those two guys that formed the first black denomination in America. The AME denomination was founded by a black and a white working oh, wow. together. Then if you take that relationship move forward a little bit, what you find is the period of what's called the yellow fever epidemic. The yellow fever epidemic of, of Philadelphia was 1793. It was terrible. No one knew what caused yellow fever back then. And so it terrorized everyone because they were losing about 120 people a day in the city to yellow fever. They were just dying off. One-tenth of the city died in that period of time. Uh, there were about 70 doctors in the city. They all left the city because they're scared to death. They're going to get yellow fever. They don't know what causes it. Well, Dr. Benjamin Rush was one of the very few who stayed in the city. He's called the father of American medicine. And the two guys that worked with him to treat yellow fever, the three of them that worked together to service that whole city, you had... Dr. Benjamin Rush signed with the Declaration, but you had Richard Allen, and you had another black pastor, Absalom Jones. Absalom Jones is the first black bishop in the Episcopal Church, and those three guys treated so much of Philadelphia. So there you've got this huge crisis going on, and what do you have? You have a white and two blacks working side by side to treat that epidemic. Great story of American history, great story of medicine, but we just don't hear it show the young general, French general, Marquis de Lafayette, as being a real key to whipping the British. And that's no question about it. He was a real key. And standing right beside him, the pictures they show in the textbooks, is an African-American. Now, the African-American is James Armistead. Nobody ever talks about him. They just think he's holding the horse for, you know, he's a, he's a black, he has to be a slave. He's, he's holding the horse for Lafayette, and that's the only reason he's there. No, he's there because those two guys together that brought an end to the American Revolution. Well, how so? Well, James Armistead was a double spy in the American Revolution. Oh my James, a great story. James Armistead. Why is it that African Americans particularly are left out of American history? Well, I think that the answer to that question of why African Americans are left out of American history fits in a bigger scheme of what happens in education. In education, there has been in the last 50 years a real movement to just get God out of history books. We just leave him out. Well, as you look at elements where God has worked, even current polling today, and has for a number of years, shows that the most Christian community in America is the African American community. A higher percent of African Americans are Christians than any other group. So if you're going to talk about African American heroes, by and large, you're going to have to talk about some Christians. And since we don't talk about Christians in textbooks, African Americans really receive the brunt of that. It's pretty difficult to find many African American heroes that were not Christians. What and so now, and what there's happens? been another tendency in our textbooks. The tendency in our textbooks is when we show heroes, we like to show either victims or angry people. Right. We want to show people that were fighting the injustice of the system, that wicked government. We're going to show people who fought it, or we're going to show people who were victimized in some way. And there are plenty of those out there, but there's tons of inspirational stories. That the Ashton Jones and the Richard Allens, and this is another great example. This right here is a document, original document signed by a judge. Uh, this is signed in 1814 by a judge named Wentworth Cheswell. And Wentworth Cheswell was a black judge in America in 1814. And by the way, he was elected to office in 1775 in New Hampshire. So here's a judge who's been elected to office for 40 years who's black American. We never hear about African Americans getting elected to office. We thought all that started with Barbara Jordan and Andrew Young back in, in the 70s. No, no, no. African Americans elected office back in 1775, like Wentworth Cheswell. And interestingly, we don't know about this guy, but he's the guy who lined up with Paul Revere. And when Paul Revere went on his ride, Wentworth Cheswell went on his ride as well. Black and white going to warn Americans the British are coming. So oh we hear part of the story. You don't hear about Wentworth Cheswell. Courier and Ives shows the first seven black Americans elected to the U.S. Congress. Significantly, all seven were Republicans. On the left side of the picture is Hiram Rhodes Revels from Mississippi, an ordained minister. He served as a missionary and pastor, recruited three black regiments, and was a chaplain during the Civil War. Revels became America's first black U.S. senator. Next is Benjamin Turner of Alabama. 
Turner was a slave during the Civil War, but within five years after the war, he had become a wealthy and prosperous businessman. Next is Robert DeLarge of South Carolina. Born as a slave, within three years of the end of the war, he was serving in the State House. He also chaired the Republican Party's platform committee and became a statewide elected official. Next is Josiah Walls of Florida. Walls was a slave during the Civil War and was forced to fight for the Confederate so Army. So do we today have it worse than them? A homeowner fights back shooting and killing a would-be burglar. Police say she shot and killed the teenage thief while he was climbing out of her window. CBS 4's Gabby Fleischman is live at the scene with the latest. Gabby. Vanessa, neighbors tell me that this home has been burglarized in the past, which is why the homeowner set up these surveillance cameras. I don't care if she have her gun license, her rights, or any of that. That is um, way beyond the law, way beyond. You have to understand, you have to look at it from every um, child's point of view that was raised in the hood. How he going to get his, his money to have clothes to go to school? Well, in a speech entitled, Our Composite Nationality, Frederick Douglass said, I know of no rights of color superior to the rights of humanity. He thought the worst thing that could happen for blacks after the Civil War was to treat them as exceptions in the law. And so today with the discursive law... So in closing, I like to just say what's not an Uncle Tom or a race traitor. You're not an Uncle Tom or a race traitor because you believe in the Second Amendment. You're not an Uncle Tom or a race traitor because you may have white friends. You're not an Uncle Tom or a race traitor because you got promoted and somebody else didn't and they're the same race as you. You're not an Uncle Tom or a race traitor because you're not from the hood, but you're black. You're not an Uncle Tom or a race traitor because you believe that abortion is killing unborn children. You're not an Uncle Tom or a race traitor if you like country music. You're not an Uncle Tom or a race traitor if you disagree with Barack Obama and you're black. You're not an Uncle Tom or a race traitor if you hate crime. Maybe you like Donald Trump, maybe you don't. But that don't make you an Uncle Tom if you do. Ben Carson is not a traitor to his race. And let's understand something. You know, I read those blogs. I know what happens. I, I read what's said when something happens on the news and we're put out there and then somebody says somebody's racist and they come to find out they're not. And I read what people write and, and with, with the uh, riots in Ferguson and I see words like niggas and coons and monkeys and things and some come from some Trump supporters. But that don't mean that all, any race is evil. And I'm not going to get on some self-righteous high horse and act like I ain't said stuff that's racially insensitive at the dinner table. We've all come short of the glory of God. And when you talk about one race being evil by default, I and my wife have both applied and went to work with companies where the management was not black or white. They were some other ethnic group and they still discriminated and would prefer their own. That don't mean you gotta lose your mind and go crazy. It means you do your best, blend in, learn your surroundings, and succeed. And we did. Truthfully, everybody, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Indian, have all talked trash about each other in racial terms on the DL. You see, you cannot have social justice without personal peace and accountability. You can't legislate morality. Ask yourself this, are you gonna die because somebody says coon? You know, if, you, if you're trying to be a chemical engineer, you got what it takes and you got the highest grade in the class, are you gonna die because somebody says coon? Or spick or chink or something like that.
He is the cause of all my joy. lamp unto my path is he without him I would fall I don't know what he is to you oh but to me he's my all in all thank you Jesus Smiling on me. Oh, you set me, you set me free. We must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. 